Hello. Welcome to the webinar series organized by CLP Smart Energy Connect. Uh, I'm Alan, the head of strategy of digital product in CLP Innovation. The webinar topic today is climate change impacts and decarbonizing the workplace. This year, the challenges associated with climate change uh, actually uh, came into even sharper focus. Decarbonization is then as seen as the social responsibility by corporations, states, and cities. And there are a growing list of companies, cities, they have announced their decarbonization targets, timeline. So among those are CLP and also Fuji Zeros. So today we are grateful that we have two distinguished speakers from both CLP and Fuji Zeros to share their decarbonization journey uh, with the audience. So the first speaker today is Ms. Kathy Nao, the General Manager, Corporate Quality and Sustainability of Fuji Zeros Hong Kong. Catherine will share Fuji Zero's journey to be carbon neutral operations here in Hong Kong. And the second speaker is my colleague Hendrik, our Director of Group Sustainability. Hendrik will talk about CLP's response to climate change and what is CLP's support to customers for their decarbonization journey. So let me hand over the stage to Hendrik. journey. So in terms of uh, sort of explaining the business model and where we sit at CLP along the value chain of electricity, um, uh, here in Hong Kong in particular, we were fully integrated all the way from the generation of electricity to the transmission and distribution and then the customer side as well. Um, so we have a, a what we call vertically integrated business, uh, where we are able to provide and deliver in a very efficient manner uh, the essential um, needs uh, for the community here in Hong Kong. So what's quite different in how things have evolved over the years is that um, it, it, this integration has enabled and provided a, a number of opportunities in regards to um, the provision of decentralized electricity, so there's a lot of renewable energy, for example, that has come on stream in the recent years by our feed and tariff, uh, by rooftop solar. Um, we are looking at avenues for um, battery storage um, and uh, integration of smart meters and uh, electrification of transport in particular, also being quite important pieces of this value chain of electricity and how we enable electrification here in Hong Kong and through that process, actually de decarbonize um, our, um, well, our city uh, that we live in. Um, what's important to remember here, though, is that CLP doesn't just operate in Hong Kong. We do have uh, a number of businesses outside here in the region in Asia Pacific, where we um, operate a number of generating units in China and in, uh, India, and as well as in Australia where we also are uh, not just generators of electricity, but also um, we, are, um, we are also um, the, uh, in the retail side. So uh, 
just wanted to double check. I guess I'm not sharing my screen, so let me try that again. Um, is that working now? Can you nod if you can see? Okay, very good. <laughs> Technology, gotta love it. it. Used to be so much easier than we're all in the same room, um, but um, we're getting better at learning. Let's move along in this virtual community that we've been developing these days. Um, so I was just on this slide here uh, trying to uh, illustrate to our um, uh, audience here of what it is that we mean when we say business model for CLP and the integration of that. And in terms of sustainability, what does that, what does that mean for us and when we see our priorities? There's a number of different um, channels and uh, key issues that we have zoomed in on through a, a rather extensive materiality assessment process that we go through as part of our annual reporting cycle, but also as uh, part of the overview and review that we do uh, for providing strategic insights uh, to the senior management team and to the overall CLP business model. So, Decarbonization being front and center for us um, as a generator of electricity, the electricity sector itself being uh, very, very um, fundamental in terms of the carbon emissions that are being emitted uh, from the sector uh, globally. And for us as well, as part of our mix of both the assets that we have, ranging from still having coal in our portfolio to um, natural gas, and then we have nuclear as well as renewable energy as well. Um, there is a real drive for us to focus on reducing the carbon intensity of electricity that we deliver um, to the grid and to our customers. I will zoom in on that in a little bit of our climate vision, uh, climate vision 2050 and call it to provide some more insights on that. At the same time, with sustainability and the, the, the risks we see to the business from a sustainability lens, are uh, very much focused on the digitalization aspect, which, um, really focusing on two angles. One is on the changing technologies and the technical solutions that are out there uh, uh, for our own portfolio of assets in terms of improving efficiency, but also, um, more and more importantly, and this is where Alan and his team come in, in terms of providing energy solutions to uh, customers to allow them to be more efficient in the uh, consumption and the use of electricity and through that process itself actually reducing the carbon footprint. Um, the other angle of course that's important as we operate in this cyber world is cyber resilience and um, data protection in particular and those angles and those pieces of um, their, our day-to-day -day operations uh, being quite fundamental that we protect our assets from cyber attacks as you can imagine if you were to look at a control room such as this um, in the background that I'm have here, my virtual background, this is not my office. <laughs> um, but there is obviously a quite, a, um, quite a lot of connectivity involved here, and we need to make sure these systems are indeed resilient and not open to um, any sort of and unwanted um, cyber intrusions. Um, and of course, the data protection side, given the customers that we serve here in Hong Kong, over two and a half million in this area, the some customers we have in Australia, we make sure that their information is protected and take care of them. So, all that is underpinned by a transformation in our workforce. So, it coming from a more traditional business model of generation and heavy assets and transmission and distribution networks. That we have in place, um, there is an um, increasing need to really change our workforce to be more agile and more um, sort of um, being able to deliver on the innovation side and the new technologies that, as smart systems that are growing and becoming increasingly more important as part of our business, as part of the utility sector, and as part of CLP vision for uh, becoming a utility in the future. So the transformation of that workforce is really, um, an ongoing um, um, effort from our side to make sure that we have the right skills to deliver. 
so this sort of sums up what we mean by sustainability and uh, how we manage sustainability and how this field can be. And even a little bit on the climate change side of things, I uh, kind of vision 2050, CLT was one of the first Asian headquartered um, companies to set itself decarbonization target, meaning uh, uh, carbon intensity of the electricity that we deliver um, uh, should be at a certain level that is more appropriate um, in terms of mitigating the impact of climate change. We had initially published our final vision in 2007, most recently updated that um, just in, uh, in 2017 and published that in 2018. Um, uh, well, these new targets we published in 18. Just lastly, though, we updated the actual kind of vision document, um, and that made a number of very um, important commitments and also um, significant commitments. Where, in particular, we made the decision to no longer invest in coal, in coal-fired generation assets. So this was a, um, a, an ongoing discussion that uh, went right to the most senior level of management and the board in terms of we had a number of projects that we had on the go for a number of years on the, on the coal side and the decision was taken that we should no, should no longer pursue these because our final vision says that we need to progressively decarbonize that we uh, intend to phase out coal by 2050 and then we have a real drive to increase the share of renewables in our assets and in particular also uh, focusing on the transmission and distribution side of the energy electric utility side of, of the business. So this uh, decarbonization trajectory here was updated where we are looking at an 80% um, reduction from our 2007 levels uh, up to 2050 in terms of the kilogram, kilograms of CO2 per unit of electricity sent out. So um, currently we sit at about 0.6. Uh, is, this is the group portfolio. So this is not just Hong Kong, this is for the entire group of assets um, in the various businesses, um, in the various markets that we operate in. And we uh, intend to bring that down to 0.15 by 2050. We also have nine uh, um, more clean energy targets, as we call them. And it's a combination of renewable energy as well as um, non-carbon. And uh, renewable obviously being wind and solar for our case, but for non-carbon, that's also the inclusion of nuclear power. And we intend to have 30, 40% respect for that for the year 2030. Um, in terms of our efforts here in Hong Kong, um, that we had quite a bit of time spent on, um, uh, well, there's a lot of planning together with the government in terms of what it is um, that we want to do to change the carbon intensity of the electricity that we deliver to customers here in Hong Kong. And um, that means really the um, progressive uh, shutdown of coal and in place uh, we are building new gas fired uh, combined cycle gas turbines here in Hong Kong uh, and that is a significant investment that is coming uh, on stream as, um, this year already and with additional units coming online in the coming years as well as um, uh, uh, LNG gas receiving terminal being built here in Hong Kong to allow us to source the most competitively priced electricity. If you compare the carbon intensity of coal versus gas, you have about a um, half uh, in terms of reduction. So that's uh, really quite significant. It's a step in the right direction. But we really need to combine that together with a number of other solutions. Um, and that is as simple as utilizing what we have on hand here with our landfill uh, gas project uh, here in Hong Kong, where we want to utilize that gas instead of uh, sort of venting it off and creating greenhouse gas emissions through that. Um, uh, we worked with the government on their um, landfill sites to also generate electricity from that gas. We are building new interconnections to the, um, to the Guangdong grid uh, to allow us to import more clean energy, may that be from nuclear or renewable sources. Um, and then over time, we are also investing here in Hong Kong, in particular, uh, uh, smart meters being deployed and rolled out that allow us really to uh, provide the customers with much more control over how electricity is consumed and when, um, and also providing us with the essential information to support our customers and um, uh, for them to reduce the, their consumption. 
there's a number of demand response programs that are in place and uh, and customer solutions that um, Alan will get into. Besides that, we have focused quite a bit on, on charging infrastructure. And that the organization of the transport network here in of that puzzle. I won't draw on this one so much, but this does give us a bigger focus on climate change. We a task force that was implemented to support the corporates and investors to really, uh, zoom in on the climate risk and opportunities that each company has. And we're doing quite a bit of work on that at the moment in terms of developing scenarios for the future, climate scenarios, uh, how we see the world unfold, unfold uh, 20, 2030, 2050 from a climate risk perspective, sort of the physical impact of climate change that are expected, and how we see our markets change uh, due to changing regulations or, or customer expectations, and what sort of technical solutions can be deployed, and what does that actually mean for our business and uh, bottom line. This is sort of a separate stream, but it's an important one to help us understand how we need to change as a utility and how we can better cater to our customers. We do do quite a bit of this type of engagement, actually, as we as we are doing right now, to uh, help everyone better understand uh, climate risks. And uh, we're working with a number of different organizations locally, as well as across the world and across the various markets where we operate in. And notably here, free electrons being one of the big piece that's important for us to uh, really scout the most innovative uh, um, that, that would help us particular here at the Cognize uh, As mentioned, we have fuel and tariffs in Hong Kong, so that means we can install uh, a renewable energy system and new building to uh, a premium tariff that uh, support you uh, in the capital investment of that. And we do issue the renewable energy certificates, correct, as we call them, based on that. We have quite a bit of programs in place in Australia to allow our customers to become carbon neutral. And we do have carbon credits itself that are generated from our renewable assets in India for our customers and anyone actually for that matter uh, to help them reduce their carbon footprint. Um, Smart Energy Connect and uh, our CLP solutions do provide an additional avenue and this is really the, where we see quite a bit of opportunity in terms of um, making sure that we consume electricity as efficiently as possible both at home, at the workplace, um, wherever we are, uh, so that um, that uh, through that process, there's less wastage, there's less need to generate electricity, actually. Um, and uh, overall, the uh, footprint of the electric utility sector, and okay, that is indeed the um, objective of the artist. And we do see quite a number of business that may not be using renewable energy, which is very necessary energy management solution and the likes uh, that we want to share with our customers. On that note, this was a real quick snapshot. Um, I just wanted to highlight a few things in terms of what it is that, um, what we mean by CLP, and by sustainability at CLP, uh, and how we respond to the challenges of climate change. It cannot be underestimated um, that the, the dire challenges we face currently in the world of a changing climate, is that from, in particular from a physical impact perspective, but all, in particular also what companies need to do to respond to that and what each of us individually need to do to reduce our carbon footprint. Um, and that is where CLP stands at this point. So I thank you, Alan. Thank you, Hendrik. So now uh, let us welcome our next speaker, Ms. Kathy Lau from Fuji Xerox to share with you about uh, their sustainability journey to become carbon neutral operations in Hong Kong. So let's welcome Catherine. Okay, thank you. So I'm uh, very pleased to have a chance to share about the journey of Fuji Rock Hong Kong to be a carbon neutral operations. So before that, uh, let me introduce a bit about Fuji Xerox. Uh, Fuji Xerox actually is a joint venture between Fujifilm and Xerox Corporation back in 1962. Uh, our headquarter is office in Japan, where 15 overseas operating companies. Uh, of Hong, uh, in Hong Kong, actually, we have about a thousand colleagues. 
Uh, from the left part, you can see that actually Fuji Zero is more uh, copier company or multifunction printers. But uh, starting from 2000, you see that we have a lot of solutions, services to be provided to the customers. And uh, by April 1st next year, because the joint venture between Fujifilm and Xerox will be ended, so uh, we will rename ourselves as a new company called Fujifilm Business Innovation. Yet our services and support to our customer will remain the same. Uh, then a bit about locally in Hong Kong, we have our first local sustainable report uh, published in 2010. And uh, when we are in the fifth uh, um, anniversary, we actually uh, work for zero carbon operations. And in 2016, we have own, uh, we also launched our own uh, ESG dashboards and a management tool called ESG. And then you will see from 2017 onward, actually because the share holding by Fujifilm has been increased from 25% gradually to right now 100%. You can see that we adopt a lot of Fujifilm direction into our sustainability journey. Um, to talk more, um, we can see that right now, our, um, we serve the same messages as other Fujifilm uh, companies. Uh, during the COVID-19, I think it's a lot of challenges on the patient area. We, when we come infected with the COVID-19, probably you will be very frustrated. We, we need people support. But ironically, we cannot do that because the medical staff need to protect themselves too. That's why we have been used the power of the photography to print them their, their faces on their coats so that to make the, um, um, to in enhance the connection between people. And that program has not just in, uh, deployed in US, Russia, but a lot of Europe company also. And then on the uh, very close area in China, we also donate a lot of printers to the um, government and public agency to help them to support a lot of print um, uh, requirements. And now talking about commitment, we do have very aggressive plan have uh, lately has been certified by the scientific based targets. We actually have that uh, in the previously we have so many years have a 30% reduction on the CO2 emission across the entire water life cycle. But right now we change the target from 30 to 45 and uh, uh, hopefully by 2030, we will achieve this uh, commitment. Not just about the target on the figures, we also have been put a lot of effort on doing the rena re renewable energies. So we joined the RE 100 and uh, commit to uh, convert 50% of our purchase electric power to renewable one. And then by 2050, uh, we will convert to up to 100%. So talking about our year 100, how's our current situation? Right now, across all the Fujifilm sites uh, in the global, we actually have 14 sites already achieve 100% renewable energy supply. And I have put two examples here. One is in the Netherlands, uh, we have our own wind generator power and um, each year we can generate the capacity up to 10,000 kilowatts. And then in China, we have Fujifilm printing plates in Xuzhou, and uh, we have our own solar power generation system. And the capacity can right now uh, generate up to 1,400 uh, uh, kilowatt per year. Um, then uh, we also have an um, initiative to work on the uh, supply chain. Actually, for this, how we do it, we have this theme called 360 degree of sustainability. And then we start in our supply chain. We do our procurement with a very robust set of standards. We have, will we meet the UN Global Compacts and the Electronic Industry Code of Conduct. Locally in Hong Kong in 2017, we actually also verified by our compliance to ISO 20400, which is talking about sustainable procurement. 
And then talking about manufacturing, we do have a very um, invented concept because we treat our, all our user product as natural resources. So we start to think how to do the life cycle planning, reuse and recycling design, and do the environmental impact assessment before we manufacture. That's why we call that an inverse manufacturing. And then talking about equipment in use, of course, energy saving technology has to be applied. And also on the end of life disposal, we all proactively to start our circular economy back in 1995, starting in Japan uh, and also in other all Asia Pacific sites. We call that a Fuji Zero Integrated Recycling System so that to proceed for zero emission. And also, of course, for the waste area, we minimize all the waste to the landfill. And then to look into more details, we can see how actually our energy saving product is. Uh, you can see that Fujifilm Group have our green value product uh, from moving from silver to go to diagram. We do have some solution we actually fit into this green value product. But more, we also have our product itself have been putting a lot of effort to doing the energy saving uh, during the idle time when the machine is not in use, but also when, it, when the customer have to use it. On the warm up time, we also to invest a lot of technology to shorten the time yet on the energy saving can be uh, reduced. As such, uh, we have in the past 13 times already have won the Japan very prestigious energy saving uh, uh, award, which is called Energy Conservation Grand Prize. Um, and then on the right hand side of the diagram, we can say that when we have to use electricity, we have to go to renewable energy. And that will be our plan to moving 100% by the physical year 2050. And then uh, the bottom part, you can see that the actual renewable energy we consume have been reduced uh, gradually in the past five years. You may have a question, oh, why well, you, your renewable energy have been reduced? Because um, are your business in serious trouble and that's why it caused the, the issue. Uh, I can say that, with, yes, we have some, some, some challenge in business, but the reduction is not that huge. It's just about 5% reduction uh, if you're using 2019 versus 2018. But actually uh, on our technology, it actually helped to reduce double digit. On, on our operating profit, we also maintain our double digit growth. And that will be the situation. So technology can help to reduce our energy usage. And then in Hong Kong, we do have a very, um, I say, uh, uh, myself is very proud of this program called Visible Green Initiative. Actually, that will be a program to drive for the free wins, including because we actually encourage our customer or stakeholder to give us a compliment. For every common compliment we receive, uh, we will have the donation of the um, we'll commit to donate to uh, the carbon neutral offset program. Uh, for this, every complement will worth about 18 at least kilogram um, uh, on this area. So I think feeling is an uh, employee side because they will perform better if they receive compliment, they will feel uh, motivated and then they will work even better. From the customer, they can receive a better service. And for the NGO or partner we have right now, you can see that we are partner for CLP. Uh, for every company we receive, we will donate for the programs. So you can see in our past, uh, locally, uh, the data we can see in the past six years, our carbon emission in Hong Kong specifically, we have uh, quite a good number of reduction, almost 20% uh, from uh, 2014 to this year, to uh, last year. And uh, some soft program we have actually uh, uh, worked in parallel, including how we have to upgrade on the server system. And we also have the skill to switch from a desktop computers to more energy efficient laptops. We also will adopt a lot of energy efficient lighting devices and electronic appliances in office. We, in our office, we also do the zoning and uh, implement the earth out every uh, every day, every working day. We will turn off during the lunchtime. 
And also we will conduct computer off check. That is actually we will have the colleague to randomly check uh, our other colleague whether they turn off the notebook or computer. If they don't, we will record the name and then we will have some follow up with them. So that will be something that we can help to build the habit on energy uh, uh, reduction. And then not just about some soft program, we do use technology, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, in uh, about eight years ago, we start our how to build our ecological workplace. We do uh, a very big exercise to study all our own use multifunction printer. Actually, for a thousand of person in the past, we actually used about 64 MFP. But after our exercise to strike the balance that they can uh, walk a little bit, but still they can print a document by our network uh, solution. Uh, we can manage to reduce 60% of all our MFP. If we reduce 60%, means that you have less electricity to be used. Yes, uh, on the other hand, I still can maintain the operation without receiving any complaint from my colleagues. And uh, other just on uh, the consolidation of MFP, we have more and more solution in the past few years to help ourselves to sustain the reduction, including we have looked into a business process automation, and uh, we have our own dashboard and analytic to keep track on all the information. Because on, uh, as a sustainability people, it's very hard to sell the management or to talk to other colleagues without data. That's why we have our own uh, dashboard for IESG, we have been launched in 2016. And right now, uh, I think we have further enhanced this solution to including the robotic concept and a smart meter so that to ensure all the solution can uh, really have a good effect and uh, under good management. And on top of that, we also uh, have on pair and parallel, we need the tracking, we need the smart lighting so that to make that uh, operation function. On our paper management, we do have a core power BI also to manage the paper consumption because paper usage will also generate the CO2 emissions. So talking about on this area, besides, we have uh, also our end of life disposal. Uh, we have, I mentioned earlier, we have inverse manufacturing. We also have the closed loop system. So by the time we put our MFP on our customer side, we already start to think how to collect them back after the, the life cycle. Uh, in the past, we do have our own uh, we manufacturing factory. Uh, in different locations. For Hong Kong, we actually link to the Thailand remanufacturing uh, operation over there. But because of the um, regulation change, um, in Hong Kong government, we have to support the producer responsibility or double triple E initiative. We have to send our order small printer to that program. And other than that, because the Thailand government could not allow us to send our used uh, MFP anymore to there. That's why we also to uh, employ uh, licensed local recycler to handle them all to make sure that uh, they will not go to the landfill. So uh, I think to conclude, it's very simple that uh, I think to start with to be a carbon neutral. Before that, we can think about how to do the reduction by technology, by different type of solution, uh, or any uh, programs that you can deploy. And then if you, uh, but honestly, we will still have some carbon to be used in all operation. That is uh, because if we, we are there, we have to be using, right? And then on that part, we can think about to join the carbon neutral program like the one in CLP. Uh, we actually can help to turn the operation to be carbon neutral. And then if you are interested on uh, more information on Food is Xerox Hong Kong, uh, our coming sustainable report with this uh, lovely kids which actually is one of my colleague's daughter. Uh, you can know more about Food is Xerox Hong Kong sustainability uh, matters. And if you are interested to contact me thereafter, I have also email over there called CSL at hkg.fujisero.com. And uh, that's all for my presentation and thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. So in the next sessions, uh, it's a panel discussions. So thank you, Catherine, thank you, Hendrik to share with the audience your insights and also what uh, CLP and also Food is uh, have been 
working on this fantastic achievement for decarbonizations. But the audience actually they are quite interested to gain some insights and also advice from you guys about how to implement it, especially is the topic of today, decarbonizing the workplace. So there's a lot, a lot of questions actually I prepared. So the first one is, you know, uh, you already map out this decarbonization roadmap for your organization, self and Fuji series. So when you started this decarbonization program and sustainability roadmap, how you manage to get the executive buy to get the board to support also, can you share some tips and insight with the audience? Hendrik, how about you? you go. All right, sure, why not? Thank you. Um, very good question. Um, so I, I guess from a decarbonization perspective for CLP, there was a clear recognition that there is a number of risks uh, to the business, um, uh, fundamentally so, that we need to um, track, that we need to manage. And uh, from a um, sort of management side, uh, it was a matter of us understanding that climate change is real, uh, and we communicate that to the senior management, that uh, there's a number of solutions um, to uh, reducing the risk of climate change, and that's obviously being uh, decarbonizing and reducing carbon intensity. So it was really uh, an early recognition uh, at CLP that there is merit and there is business opportunity in decarbonization and that there is a uh, yeah, distinct possibility of reducing the carbon intensity of the emissions. And through that recognition, there was uh, appropriate governance put in place so that sustainability in itself was actually um, discussed and, um, uh, and really sort of understood at the most uh, senior level, meaning at the board level. So we installed um, or instituted a, um, a board level sustainability committee that tracks uh, sustainability, uh, that tracks ESG risks on a regular basis and then it meets about three or four times per year. This is obviously the, uh, a subset of the directors of the CLP holdings uh, company that is um, on that committee. And they don't just review uh, sort of a sustainability report or how we perform on ESG ratings, but they also do very much have insight and um, input into uh, important commitments that the company makes, such as our climate vision 2050 um, that I alluded to earlier. And just by example, that document uh, went through a number of iterations and through a number of um, discussions at the board level uh, before we came to the conclusion um, uh, and the commitments that are um, now manifested in that document and uh, have been um, sort of uh, blessed or approved by the committee. So the governance of sustainability, the governance of decarbonization is really, really fundamental in order to um, move an organization uh, towards a trajectory, towards a pathway that is, uh, if you like, sustainable or that is in line with the commitments that are expected under the Paris Agreement um, and, um, and specifically for your industry and for each industry. Um, so governance is very important um, and, uh, and also management being informed on the issues is, is, is really fundamental so that we as uh, managers can communicate up to the leadership teams, the directors in terms of what needs to happen to transform the business. Well, Catherine, can, can you share like nice. some insights, you know, when you started this Visible Green Initiatives, mm. which is a fantastic program, especially for Hong Kong customers, not only for internal, how you manage to get this up? Yeah, I think I'm lucky that my, my bosses, our board members, is actually very visionary on sustainability. So when I do have ideas and uh, I have some insight when I talk to them, is it's easy that if I tell them what's the pros and what's the cons, and hopefully the decision can make a very fast. And that's why uh, that helped me when I deploy the sustainable report, when I have idea of visible green initiative, it go very easily for the board approval. 
So um, I think in general for all the company, I think if you do have an idea, if you want to sell your boards, usually you can see uh, to sell them from the brand value, what will be the positive impact to your business and uh, how your competitor is moving. If you have, do have some idea on what happening in the market, hopefully that will help you to get the support, especially if those will be target to the new generation. Because I think in the new generation, talking about sustainability and environment or CSR, that will be something a standard. It's not something new. Like I, I sell it 10 years ago, that, that will be something uh, at that time is not so quite common, but this in this few years, it changed a lot. Thank you. Okay. So how about on sustainability governance? You know, this is also a, a key topic uh, when any organizations want to kickstart this mm. sustainability program internally. So how you manage to build the sustainability governance framework within your organizations? Okay, okay. okay. Uh, talking about governance, which is uh, for me another perspective how to do the risk management. Uh, actually, I think on the sustainability, we do need to have figures. We do need to know what's happening. We, we do need to know where's the risk. So we do the risk assessment so that we have the know where will be the risk area. And then we'll think about how to manage it. And to manage this, we usually need some program or some data to support to, um, to visualize how actually you manage the risk in which perspective. That's why we do have a lot of solution and also have the data uh, to support me to do that governance matters. I see. Uh, let, let me remind you know, all the audience, you know, if you have any questions, mm. please use the chat box to post your questions and then we'll address it one by one. Yeah. And uh, to supplement, I think one more important is how to, when you do think about governance, after do hard thing, things, we have to make sure your colleagues to have the knowledge about what, what does government mean. We, we have to communicate clearly and we do need to increase their awareness on what will be the risk for the company. So that when we have the general understanding that will help you to deploy in a better way. Hendrik, you have any tips about sustainability governance to share with the audience? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, as mentioned already, it was fundamentally it's about having that buying management team, um, as well as from um, the, the C-suite, if you like. And then it's about putting the right, um, if you like, infrastructure to make sure that these issues are discussed at the right levels uh, at the right time. So what we have at CRP is we have a, a group sustainability function, and we uh, operate in, in two directions. Uh, one um, where we very much are in tune, and we, we um, regularly consult uh, on the operation side with the business units in terms of what are the key sort of sticking points from an operational perspective. Uh, it may not be anything related to um, energy efficiency related matters or or social impacts that are affecting our operation. Um, and for that, we have a, a regular forum where we um, congregate everyone on a quarterly basis to exchange ideas and also exchange uh, experiences and, um, and, and sort of areas that need further um, sort of review work and looking out for. So that's sort of the, the, the downward uh, going into the business side. But if you then, um, what we also have in place is the Upward motion towards the C suite, the senior management team, where we have what we call the sustainability executive committee. And we meet at uh, about two month intervals to discuss the key issues. May that be climate change, may that be our reporting cycle, may that be anything related to our innovation strategy. Um, and then from there is what I referred to earlier on top of that is the board level sustainability committee. So that we can have the most important and strategic discussion uh, happening on a regular basis at uh, uh, breakfast as well. So it goes in both directions, uh, action being intended, but also at the same time, we can ensure that um, these issues are really part of decision making at the most senior level as well. Thank you, Hendrik. Uh, we have got a question from the audience about the um, uh, executive engagement. So the question is, have you used any scenarios when you to engage the top management on climate change to develop your sustainability proposal for the group? If so, you know, what 
are the exactly scenarios that you use and how you develop those scenarios or use cases in order to get the top management support. Can you share some of your experience with the audience? Uh, sure. Um, I also see that my audio is not very good. Apologies for that. It is a bit surprising. I hope it's not a bit better. Um, maybe I'll move closer. Um, but uh, in terms of scenario analysis, uh, or, uh, no change in that's uh, really relating back to what I had earlier on the slide with uh, TCFD, where uh, we have already identified um, two scenarios that are of importance to our TLP in terms of how we see the world change, and one that we, uh, is what we call a three to four degree scenario, meaning that there's a few, uh, dire consequences um, on, um, well, within the regions where we operate from a, time, from a physical climate change perspective, um, meaning that we do expect storms or flooding and certain other uh, perils and happening in our building in our business. Um, and then the flip side of that what we call the sort of 1.5 to 2 degree scenario where um, the physical impacts of climate change are primarily mitigated. Uh, but the flip side of that being that there's uh, the regulations and the, the um, sort of push for decarbonization having intensified to such a level that uh, the fundamental nature of our business would have to change as well. And perhaps at a, a rate um, that is uh, more rapid than we had currently planned. So what we're doing at the moment is actually starting a project to uh, really um, put some more deeper thinking into this. What could be the business impact of that? What are the financial implications of either one scenario? And if you like, these are two extreme scenarios, one being sort of dire physical impacts and the other being very sort of almost draconian uh, regulatory impact. Uh, to some extent, there could be a combination of those two. So we're also looking at developing a scenario that is perhaps more realistic, uh, if you like, and not so uh, black and white. Um, so this is something that's ongoing and, um, and something that uh, we, we take quite seriously in terms of also actually evaluating the, the, the merit and um, the adequacy, if you like, of our climate vision 2050. Thank you, Hendrik. How about Kevin? You know, the whole carbon neutral operations actually mm. is a big commitment. Mm. So how, how did you manage to get the first few use cases on board, especially mm. for stakeholder engagement within your organizations? Um, I think it's more because uh, the conceptually we buy it already. That's why we have uh, also have some complement received already. That's why we do some calculation. It's not in that scenario scale, but uh, after the projection and uh, how the program is going to be run, we will clearly share that with the board and then that will be the start of that also. And uh, talking about it, and I can uh, see that there's a question about yeah. sustainable budget. <laughs> yeah, just a pragmatic uh, yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yes, we, we do have. We do have it, I think, more than 10 years. We have that budget every year. We will put that as a mandatory item when I do my budget submission to the board for review. Uh, and, and actually, it requires because that will be something uh, we can use the budget item to come up we have some, um, it, it's both way. If you have initiative, we need the money. And on the other hand, if you have the money, you can think more on, on the initiative that we can do. We do have. Okay. I trust yep. CLP have too, right? <laughs> yeah. Hendrik, do you have uh, any insights? You know, the, the questions, you know, let me repeat. So mm -hmm. uh, for all this sustainability initiative, you know, do we have a dedicated budget or is done through the operation projects? Yeah, um, I mean, the answer is basically um, we have both. And I think any uh, company should have both in the sense that a lot of these issues need to be operationalized. So, you know, we have a, a strategic direction to have uh, a portfolio, for example, uh, and that needs to come through the operation, and that needs to come from the business in order to um, happen uh, and have the financing. For that. Then the flip side of that is, well, of course, uh, the group sustainability department and governance that I'm describing in itself. Yes, we certainly have the budget, we have to make 
sure that um, issues are uh, yeah, discussed at a strategic level and implemented uh, to the business. And if there's implementation at the business level, there should be budget allocated for that. Because at the end of the day, um, it's, you know, you follow the money, that's how <laughs> things happen. Uh, so quite important uh, that the business units themselves make a uh, dedicated effort in this regard as well. Thank you, Hendrik. So let's move on to the uh, next topic I've prepared about COVID. You know, everyone agrees, you know, COVID affecting everyone, our societies at all fronts. So in terms of uh, sustainability development, so how COVID actually affects you in terms of sustainability development in your organizations and also on a workplace decarbonization, is there any impact or challenges that uh, you have encountered in the past few months under COVID? Okay. Oh, okay. Uh, I think we used to, before COVID, we used to put more focus on environmental. Talking about um, sustainability, usually there's different perspectives, environment, social, and whatever. But uh, to be honest, I think we, 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 we are still have some focus on social, but uh, where is when we have the COVID, we, we start to have to look more in depth to the colleagues area. Let's say, especially most of them now working, have a period working at home. I think in the past, it's, uh, it's more common that uh, we put the business as a priority. So when we work at home, we still think that they should be at the office. But uh, when we actually right now, we change the way to work, um, uh, let's say by more webinar, by work at home, you kind of accept um, the thing happened to different colleagues. Say for example, we, we study, uh, sometimes we, we can hear the webinar will have the sound or the children or some or their pets, whatever. In the past, you think it's not usual. But right now when we're starting, um, to be honest, we on the social area, we start to accept this. Yeah. So that would be something I think the inclusion or how to uh, to use a different perspective to work together. So employee become very important, social part become important. In the past, we may only also think about uh, when that in the past it is not quite focused, but right now I think under the new um, scope, we also work very closely with our uh, partner, business partner to understand how they are going because we start to think it's not just one person. It's not a company to do things. We have to work together with the upstream and downstream workers and also how to engage other people. And this type of thing, when we start to have COVID, we, we look into it more deeper. Uh, it's it going to be changed a lot. I, I think that will be the collaboration, how we work together. Um, but with technology, we also see that uh, there are many things can happen. I think in a good way, uh, we also to manage how to um, support the other. In, in special, they have some people, they are not, um, they are in need, they, they need some help. And probably I think that is time to review and support those uh, unfortunate people. Okay. Hendrik, how about from CLP side? How does yeah. it affect your sustainability development work? Yeah. Um, so basically, the, there's, I guess, two angles to it. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry, I just gave some feedback here. Apologies for anyone in the audience uh, who's not hearing me properly. Um, there, there, there's two challenges uh, from the conversation, and, and one, you know, just to look simply at the financials and the business impact of the COVID, and it has been relatively high. So we've all had a very I think, but it's not really impacted uh, in terms of uh, the demand for electricity. Where there's certainly been uh, over the time that the Hong Kong was an example of things, lockdowns or uh, work from home arrangements to shift uh, from commercial uh, and industrial towards residential has been uh, pronounced and, and quite clear, uh, and that in itself uh, provides some level of balance uh, in terms of the consumption, the overall consumption side. But more importantly, really, what I'm uh, mentioning here is the, the impact on the workplace. 
And as you can all appreciate, the work from home arrangement um, uh, is something that we can uh, pretty much to heart and, and make sure that the health and safety is maintained uh, for uh, all staff, while at the same time keeping essential uh, services and operations like the one you see in the background uh, ongoing. We, we can't just shut down this, this sort of uh, control center that we see here, obvious reasons. Um, so there have to be a measure put in place to make sure that our staff can really continue to develop and uh, deliver what needs to get done on a daily basis, or not just in their own uh, health at the same time. Um, the situation overall, uh, otherwise, I suppose, uh, is really, um, I guess there's still some changes as well culturally. So the work from home arrangement, if you reflect back on what uh, we had here in Hong Kong yesterday, our uh, TA signal having gone up, and everyone is uh, being asked to stay at home for safety reasons due to inclement weather. Um, and traditionally uh, in Hong Kong, that means that everyone has a day off and you don't have to work. <laughs> but now with everyone being well equipped, and uh, being quite used to working from home, um, there's so much happening that way. Uh, uh, things just continue, even though um, uh, before in prior years, maybe before COVID, we would have just taken a day off. Nowadays, we, we, um, uh, we can, uh, we're all in a, in a position of continuing to work and to deliver what we need to have, um, what we have in our state for, for that day. So there's some cultural shifts, I think, that's happened as well. And at the same time, and more importantly, perhaps, is that shift towards um, uh, more openness, uh, something that could be the new norm as well, or it's part of the time that you don't always have to be in the office. There's not always an expectation that in the office, it's, that being in the office is, is the best place uh, for delivering work. But um, uh, working from home could be uh, also a flexible arrangement and something that uh, the company can be open to. Work. Centric. So I'm keen to drill into the uh, execution bit, in particular the carbon uh, neutral operations are using uh, carbon offset because it's a critical element you know, to achieve carbon neutral. So Kevin, can you share with the audience, you know, how you uh, select a carbon offset partner like CLP? You know, what are the selection criteria you used to have? I think the key will be the program whether it's trustable. So we can, uh, we can make sure that every dollar spent, you actually spend on the right area. That's why I think the trustable is number one priority that we pick. Of course, uh, when I say sure, a famous name like CLP will also Thank be you. important. And uh, the other thing, because we are right now in more uh, our business in Asia Pacific. So if there is a choice between different programs, we will prefer to be the program applicable or support the Asia Pacific area. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, so let's go to the last questions. Um, it's about, you know, if there's an organization like from the audience, they want to right now to kickstart a decarbonization for the workplace program. So what is your suggestions? You know, what is the first step to kickstart and how to monitor and promote the success? Because that's important to get the buy-in no matter from the top management mm. or colleagues mm. or even customers. So if there's nothing that have been implemented, mm. what would be the first initial success that you would recommend? Uh, for me, I think uh, to, to have a gap assessment first, how, what, what the gap is actually the, 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 po the person who promotes this thing, he must know that how is this company right now, how is the situation? And then you can start to have that and to understand how the market situation and what, where do you want to go. And then if you have that mindset, if you have this plan, we can sell that to your board uh, to get the approval or support. And then if they approve, and then you can start the initiative and program, you can properly do it. And all through this, I think another key is that you must have found a way to identify slow data so that you can track your progress and to see where will be the area for improvement? And then probably that will help you to uh, be more successful. That's a really good insight. So yeah. I hope the audience can gain some uh, valuable uh, suggestions for the uh, distinguished guests we have, uh, Hendrik and Catherine, today. So that's the end of the webinar today. So 
in the upcoming uh, functions organized by CLP Smart Engine Connect, we will have a sustainable, sustainable and smart building symposium um, conducted on the 7th of January next year in Cary Hotel. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in knowing more how CLP Smart Engine Connect can support smart building decarbonization uh, workplace, then please uh, go to our website, uh, clpscc.com or use the linking page uh, to register for the symposium. So thanks again for your time, Catherine, yeah. Hendrik, and all the audience. So I hope you find it insightful. Thanks a lot for your time. Thank you so much.